Please join me in welcoming the stars of Beautiful, Jesse Mueller, Anika Larson, and Jared Spector. Hello. Hi. Before you started working on Beautiful, yeah. how much did you know about Carol and Barry and Cynthia and Jerry? Um, I didn't know. I certainly didn't know a whole lot about uh, Barry and Cynthia. Um, I didn't know that much about Jerry Goffin either, who was Carol King's first husband, her writing partner. Um, and they had, you know, literally hundreds of hits in like the late 50s and early 60s together. Um, but I sort of knew Carol's work through, she worked with James Taylor a lot when they, in the beginning of the 70s, they were friends and they did a lot of music together and I sort of knew her stuff through him. But that was that was sort of my connection with it. I certainly didn't know the extent of like what we go into in the show. I, even musically, I didn't, I didn't know as much about her as I, I certainly appreciate now. Yeah, I mean, I had a similar experience, and it's, you know, it just goes to show, unless it's a singer-songwriter, you often don't know who writes the song. So I knew all the songs. I didn't necessarily know that Carol wrote all of them to me. You know, You've Got a Friend is like a James Taylor song, and Natural Woman is an Aretha Franklin song, and I knew all of the songs that Barry and Cynthia wrote for the most part. I just didn't know that they had written them. I didn't really know who they were. But then you look at the catalog of these, you know, these couples, and it's, you know, it's extraordinary. Yeah, it's the sort of the, it's one of the really most fun parts of the show is coming to see. And I always tell people not to read the song list in the program because it's much more fun if you don't know what next what's the next song, um, because the the reveals of wait a minute they wrote that and they wrote that it, it does make you think about uh, songwriting and appreciate somebody is actually writing these hits. If if it's not a singer songwriter, um, then somebody is writing these hits. And like we wrote we wrote um, You've Lost That Love and Feeling, which is the number one song played on the radio of all time. So you know Barry and Cynthia, you just don't know you know Barry and Cynthia. And the three of you must have done a bunch of research to get to know these characters. Yeah. What was one of the things you were most surprised to learn about these people and their careers? I actually, one of my favorite moments of doing research was they worked at a building called 1650 Broadway, which is Broadway and 51st, and there's a picture that um, I found at one point, it's in, actually in a couple of the books, about 1650, and it's um, all of the people who wrote songs there, and there were lots of hits that came out of that building, um, but it's a picture of a sea of men in suits and two female faces, it's Carol and it's Cynthia, and that just really floored me, to the, deg the degree to which they were extraordinary women, um, and both of them are so humble about it, and say that somehow at the time, even though they were women doing... Uh, men's work in a, in a men's world, uh, they didn't really think about it. They didn't think of it as, as their gender as being an obstacle, that they, they just, that's what they wanted. She, Carol wanted to write music and Cynthia wanted to write lyrics, and so they did it. And, and I don't um, think they thought of it be... as groundbreaking either at no. the time. It just didn't occur to them not, not to do it. Yeah. They knew they were capable, so they just did it. Yeah. And people let them, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's just the concept of what Donnie Kirshner put together with taking teenage writers to write songs for teenage artists who were selling, you know, uh, to teenage record buyers. I mean, that concept of what he, what he started doing and, you know, and just as we went through finding out that, you know, these little, you know, pairs of Jewish kids in offices were writing all of these songs, a lot, especially a lot of R&B songs um, for all of these prominent black groups, the Shirelles and, um, and the Drifters, et cetera. And you would just never think that, that would ha that's how these songs came about. And then you find out, wow, you know what I mean? This, like, you know, two yeah. writers from Brooklyn. Yeah, and there was this real, I mean, it was an extraordinary time to be born in Brooklyn, apparently, because it was, it was just a whole cluster of people. I mean, it wasn't just these guys. It was a lot of others. I mean, Neil Sedaka, it was Neil Paul Simon. Uh, Paul, Paul Simon, Simon yeah. Um, it was, uh, there were so many of them that came out of that time. Yeah. And, and I think um, that generation, too, was uh, part of that came from that generation had an appreciation of the generation that came before it, which was all the writers of Tin Pan Alley and a lot of the people that were writing Broadway musicals. And, and I know that, um, you know, the real Barry, Cynthia, Carol, and Jerry, like they... When this all came together and it became a Broadway musical, they were all so thrilled because they had all had an investment in that sort of art form before. Like Carol and Jerry, one of the first things they set out to do together was to write a musical and write a play. It never really happened, but like they're portrayed in a musical now, so it's kind of cool. Yeah, that's so cool that you bring up the real people who are all alive. Jerry, Cynthia, and Carol are still around, still with us and still. Actually, great. Jerry Jerry passed oh, away. Jerry passed away. Jerry passed away. But um, but yeah, the the three 
the other three writers are still. But that alive was only a few months ago. So. Yeah, it was only a few. But he was around when you were first putting up. Yeah, and he came. So all yeah. of them have seen the show. Yeah, which is so great. But Carol didn't end up seeing the show until a little bit into the run. Mm -hmm. You had met her once, I believe, in San Francisco when you were running. There, yeah, we met her. Got back. Well, we, we met yeah, we met her when we got back. So we did this show out of town in San Francisco for like a month, right? Yep. Ish. Okay. So we rehearsed in New York, then we went to San Francisco and did the show. And we came back, and I remember I saw I saw you. I was, we had a week off, and we were walking down. I don't remember what Herschel Studio it was, but I was walking down the street, and I saw Jared walking in, and I was like, "Oh, I can't wait to give him a hug." And I think I did. I walked into the like the vestibule. And I was already then, like slack jawed. Yeah, he had already seen it. So she had her back turned to us, but I saw Sherry, her dot, one of her daughters, and her manager. She's her manager now, and she's been very involved in the project. She's one of our lead producers, very instrumental in making it all happen. And I just see the back of Carol's head, and I knew it because I saw the hair. And I was like, and I think I just looked at yeah, you, and we I was like, like, all right, so we guess this is happening today. <laughs> And then sure enough, we got up in the elevators, and Sherry kind of turned to me, and she was like, I have someone I'd like you to meet. I was like, okay. Absolutely, I would I'd like to have that happen. And she was just, this, she was so cool. And then, but yeah, then she didn't see, that was what, November? Yep. And she didn't see the show until April. So it was very it. difficult for her to see. Yeah, it w I, that's what I had heard. And then she came to see it and she said. Not because it wasn't good, but because no. it was. No, because no, it was good. Because it was in good. Fact. No, she did she see said, that. Yeah, no, she no, did she see said, that. Yeah. She was like. Because she, you know, she'd hear things from people that friends would go see it and stuff. And it, it was almost like the more positive feedback came back about like, Carol, it's really, really great. It was like the harder it was for her to see it because if you if you haven't seen the show, if you do, hopefully you come see it. It portrays a lot of really, well, for all the, the writers involved, it portrays these very difficult, intimate, life-changing moments in their young lives and their young careers. And yeah, it was just very difficult for her to sort of watch it all happen again. I mean, she lived through it, so. So what was the night like that she came to see the show? You didn't know she was in the audience. Mm -hmm. What no, none, like? none of us knew. No one in the building knew. Nobody well, like was allowed to know. One stage manager, yeah. our press people had to know because they were doing, you know, the like secret service agent of like, get her in, don't let anyone notice her. She had a she wig and she had a disguise on. <laughs> and Jared was doing the, the speech for um, Broadway Cares Collecting, which, which the theater community does twice a year, right? And he's starting, the, he's, you got to about... I was... You know, this is after my we normal bow. This is after yeah, we, we bow, bow, right? We have no idea if she's there. And they go out and start the thing. And they had told us that the couple of days before, like, we're going to tape the Broadway care speech. In tricky For press. Pools. And, of course, you know, I'm a schmuck. I'm, yeah, sure, whatever. That makes sense. No, that makes no sense. But sure, fine. Um, so we're ready for the cameras to be in the crowd. So, it, you know, we were all prepared. So it wasn't, it wasn't alarming. And then I get half, you know, 10, 13, 10, 15 seconds into the speech. And suddenly there's this gasp <gasps> from the crowd. And I'm like, what the hell happened? I look over, and there she is. Just she's walking out of her stage right with a microphone in her like sparkly being. black jacket. <laughs> like, and the audience <laughs> is just going nuts. And I looked, at, I saw her, and I immediately turned to Jesse because I was like, "How's Jesse doing?" And Jesse immediately face crumples, just immediate tears. I think I went into a cold tears. sweat. So then I sympathy cried. I think we didn't stop crying for about fifteen minutes. The audience lost their minds, yep. and then she, she took raised the mic. She took thirty thousand dollars single handedly for Broadway Cares that night by singing "You've Got a Friend." For the audience. She took the mic and just took over the stage. And she yeah. said, this is my first time seeing it and it's effing awesome. She did say that. <laughs> you can actually, if you go on YouTube and type in Carol King's Surprise, you can see. There's like a four minute version of it. That's amazing. And Anika, you have one of my favorite stories about meeting Cynthia as well and the kind of the relationship that you've developed together in yeah. researching your character and getting to know her. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we're, we've become real real buddies. We actually went out, we went on a sort of a double date um, and went out drinking together at one point and that was super fun. And lots of stories, lots of um, truths came out that I can't reveal. But um, she's... She's really loving. It's, it's not really a side of her that you see too much. She's just super sassy and funny in the show, but she's got this real loving side, so she's really taken me under her wing, and we've become really good friends. Um, and so she e we email back and forth all the time, and it's, we've beca it's, this game has started where she, she calls Dear Me and signs you, but it's always a different, like I'll say I'm, you know, eight times a week you, and she'll write back Vintage You, and it's just become this little game. Yeah, super cute. She's so funny. She's really as funny as she is on stage. So um, it's always just... she. she she makes me laugh a lot. Yeah, and then Jared, you had the wonderful opportunity of, of performing with Barry when you did a concert at 54 Below in the city. Can you talk a little bit about working with him? And yeah, that, that yeah, it was so. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, he's it was it was 
kind of a fun little role change because it, it, it's been a while since he performed. Um, even though he has records out, and I've listened to his to his um, some of his CDs, and he he sounds so he still sounds great. He still really sounds great. And uh, but you know, but he called me. You know, we worked it out over over time. We had, a bu- we had a bunch of phone conversations, and he was a little bit nervous. I hope you know he doesn't hear this and get embarrassed. But he was a little bit nervous, and he hadn't you know sung in a while, and asked me if there's can make sure that there's lyrics so that just in case he forgets. And <laughs> I said no problem. We're gonna whatever you need, it'll be totally taken care of. And then I you know we just we had this band rehearsal with you know with this, the, all the guys I usually all the guys and girls I usually play with and Barry and he came in and we sang and then he you know he was going to sing uh, somewhere out there by himself the piano and you know it's just amazing to see seven eight veteran they musicians wrote, Cynthia and Barry long after the show ends but they wrote the song somewhere, somewhere out, there out there from the, an American tale yeah. the movie yeah so there's you know the se- seven or eight of us are just in this rehearsal room watching him you know and just weeping alone and then we got to do it on stage again. You know, he came up and sang uh, several songs, and he sang somewhere out there in front of everybody. And I, I, I've seen actually seen pictures of myself, kind of like a little boy on a stool just watching him. And Nika and I were and there. He, we saw it happen, and we were sitting with Cynthia at least the one night. Yeah, that was the one night. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah that was the one happened. night. Yeah. yeah, it was really cool. And to watch Cynthia watch Barry, it was just very cool. Cool. I didn't get to see it, but I heard that it was amazing, and it sounded. Like such a fun night. Yeah, so it was really it was such amazing. Such a great opportunity. Um, another great part of the show is, you know, Carol King's a wonderful piano player, and she plays piano and for all the songs. And Jesse, on stage, you had to kind of learn that ability, and also, but it's not actually you playing the songs in the show. So talk to us about that bit of theater magic and how you train to do it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm playing. Everybody that plays instruments in the show is playing them. I mean, the pianos are all functional. There's no sounding boards in them. The keys are all functional. Jared plays the piano in the show. Jared plays the guitar in the show. And several other people play guitars and drums and things like that. So we all had lessons to make sure that we were syncing up with what was happening in the pit because the sound was being sourced from what's happening in the pit. So, um, and you know, when we were all really game for that, I know I am sure speak for myself, but um, to me it was a huge part of making it as realistic as possible. I mean, I had to sort of take it all, take it on as another acting challenge because I'm not as good of a piano player as she is, obviously. Um, but um, but yeah, I went back into lessons, and so we'd go to rehearsal for eight hours a day, and then I'd have a piano lesson after that, and um, and uh, yeah, and then it's just sort of it's changed to as the show has changed because our musical director Jason Howland is a brilliant piano player, and he's also really a um, very soulful and instinctive player. So he'll play things differently sometimes. He also from night gets to bored. Night. Let's be honest. Yeah. He, gets, he, gets he gets bored. bored. Well, he gets bored because he's like a genius. So he's like down in a pit. You know what I mean? Like sitting the entire show playing for two and a half hours. So he gets bored. So he does things and he changes things up, and I have to. I have to listen to what he's doing. And so it's it's a combination of listening, watching. We have monitors sort of around the um, the perimeter of where the mezzanine is in the theater. So so we can see him for cues and things like that. So and he's also right. At, and he's at, right at there. The so feet, sometimes so I can see him sometimes watching on the monitor. But always, always listening acutely for little different licks or something is different, a different baseline, a different... He messes with you a lot too. Yeah, he messes with me a lot, especially you when I'm it, when, I, when I'm singing when I'm playing for Cynthia, especially because I'm, boy, not, I'm not I'm not because I'm not singing lead on it, so then I can actually pay attention to. And I'm looking right over the piano, and he's right there, so I can always catch him. J- Jason is. Uh, I mean, I think this is one of the the, the things that makes the show so special. Um, the the better that illusion is, the the more believable yeah. the show becomes. And Jason has done such an amazing job at capturing. The, like the authentic personality of each piano player, and mm-hmm. um, you know it's uh, it's an ama- it's amazing to watch Jesse um, mimic the creation of the sound that Jason is actually playing, so that it really does look like she's doing it because she plays with Carol's attitude and and like, right you know, he does and, and, and then I'm doing what I've seen him do yeah and so and so her physicality and I try to do the same thing because you know they're exciting piano players they play with gusto and you know so you can't just tickle you really have to dig in and so you have to play confidently even if you're not really do you playing feel it, it in your shoulders too like yeah the all the time oh, yeah. I mean I don't play as many uh, obviously as many songs but um it's yeah I mean it's it's wonderful to watch I me mean, sometimes we forget that she's not playing because she's so in it you know and uh, that synergy and I mean, and that changes the way that you sing vocally, sitting oh, at yeah. the piano. Well, and I was also, just going to say, yeah, yeah, one of the things that's so fun about the show, I mean, there's some there's some um, freedom because it's pop music. It's not like we're doing, I don't know, like Rodgers and Hammerstein, where you really, you you know, you do, or your song time, you know, your exact rhythms, and you're like, because, because of Jason, the music director, we have a little bit of freedom, and he does things a little differently. If he plays something different, 
I sing a little differently or sometimes when I sing something a little different, he'll play something different. He'll re he'll reframe a chord and re it, it's it's really cool. And it's one of the things that keeps it really um really fresh and really kind of different from night to night and very much alive, I think, both for the performers and for the audiences. Yeah, it makes it rock and roll. Yeah, we feel, I mean, exactly. it feels like you're singing with a band because you really are singing with a band. You're singing with an improvisational group of musicians who are staying true to you know a certain framework so that the show continues to go and you know tempos are de- are general generally set. But we have you know from the top down, we have this amazing group of musicians who are varying slightly all the time so that we all can stay alive within the music, which really makes it exciting. Yeah, I'm going to ask one final question, then we'll open it up for audience questions. You mentioned that it is pop music, and that you mentioned earlier with. Um, the idea of young songwriters writing for young artists. How do you think that these writers and singers have influenced today's artists? We were all just were like, well, <laughs> where do we begin? No, um, I mean, kind of, where do, you, where do you begin? I mean, if we hadn't had the Carol Kings and the Carly Simons and the Joni Mitchells of the world, we wouldn't have the Sarah Bareilleses and the Katy Perrys and the... Um, Alicia Keys. And the Alicia Keys and the, you know what I mean? We wouldn't have so many people not just for what they did musically but also what they did for women in music and sort of setting a bar that way but um i mean these writers like we said before these writers were immensely influential and and it was also because they were they were also really smart musicians and they know they were well-trained musicians i mean they they didn't know just pop music they their pop music was so good because they understood classical music and they understood jazz and they understood understood blues and they understood you know what I mean all these kind of root music which they all used in the creations of their songs and they used it in the courting and the f- and the form the, the way they would shape their songs um, which you know what I mean songwriters are, are still using today people are always messing with it and breaking it and coming away from it and coming back to it but it's like they're hugely influential I mean I, I think you know what I mean even in like 10 20 years like these kind of writers are going to be they are as influential as like, they're going to be like the new standards. You know what I mean? As we see standards today of like the Irving Berlins or, you know, the Cole Borders of the world. Like, yeah, there's no this reason. This is kind of th- what these people are or will be now. Yeah, the idea of a rock and pop American, uh, 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 that rock and pop music will be part of the sort of great American songbook. Yep. These are the, these are the writers of the songs that will be, in, that should be included in that. And it's in, so American. Like yeah, it's very uniquely American. American. And they come from a time when it was more, common that everyone played the piano, that more people played the piano, that every house had a piano. I mean, in Tin Pan Alley times, there weren't so many records available to everyone all the time, so people ran out and got sheet music and took it home and played their favorite song, and it wasn't until records and radio became more and more prominent that people played piano a little less because they didn't have to play it in order to hear their favorite songs, but when you had to play it, everyone had to play it. I mean, that's the culture that they came from, so they were so well-trained and so well-versed in all different... You know, you ask Barry, and I've asked each of them, like, who's the better... And, you know, they each say the other's a better musician. Oh, no, he's a better musician. And no, no, she's the better piano player. And they're, you know, they're all so complimentary and, and, and lovely. And it's, you know, it's so cool to, if you go back and listen to each of them, one influenced the other, just the way the Beach Boys and the Beatles did the same thing. And, you know, and Carol and Paul Simon and Elton John at a later time, you know, all influencing each other. And that continues to today. And now, you know, you have people like Sarah Bareilles and Bruno Mars and, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the newest generation of songwriters like that. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's take some questions from the audience. Hello. Hi. Um, I, I saw the show in November, and there were so many people in the audience who knew every song. You literally heard the light bulbs go off in their head when you sing the Tonight You're Mine completely or some kind of wonderful starts, and you hear that these people know the songs. Was it taxing to play a woman who's so iconic that everybody knows her music was it nerve-wracking to, to be that person, knowing that you're portraying what people are already so fond of? Oh, yeah, absolutely. To me, that was like the huge underlying fear was like, well, this could, I could either succeed at this or I could fail miserably. And it, I, I don't know, I guess that was part of what was intriguing and the challenge of it. I, I, I felt connected to her music and I, that was the thing I kept coming back to. And I just felt like if I just keep coming back to that, because the more and more I learned about her, I think that's that's what she kept coming back to. Um, but yes, absolutely. You deal with the expectation of, yeah, you deal with people's expectations. You know what I mean? And, and it's not even that, 
it's not even just that they know the music. It's that people have, like you said, a very um, a very deep connection to the music because for a certain generation, you know what I mean, it was literally the soundtrack of their lives and these very important moments in in their lives informing who they became and, and the music is like, it's a synergy of that. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I thought about it a lot in the beginning and then I had to kind of forget about it and then it always creeps up and then I try to push it away. But you know what I mean? The other thing that, and I'm not just saying this, but like, the other thing that happened, the shift that happened was it was the idea of how we're going to do this, how am I going to do this, how am I going to do this. Then you get in a rehearsal room and you start the work and you realize there's so much work to be done and you get in the room with the people that you're doing it with and you're like, oh, well, this is going to be my Carol because this is my Barry and this is my Cynthia and this is my Donnie Kirshner and this is my Jerry Goff and, and then you form it from there because you do remember that you're telling a story so there's some artistic license that's taken there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something I think about all the time and I and I think it it um like we all know we have a very high bar and then that's what that's what keeps us motivated every night to tell the stories, you know, as truthfully as we can and with as much integrity that we can. All right. You brought it up earlier that music was recorded produced or written at 1650 Broadway. Why is it that Alden Music being at 1650 and so many other publishers in at 1650, did the music become known as the Brill Building Sound, which was at 1619, had nothing to do with... Right, different building. This happens a lot. Um, they, were, they were sort of happening at the same time. There's, there's, this, there's this sort of swift line that, that happens in the show very quickly. Donnie Kirshner has a line about, like, it's when Carol first comes to pitch her song and he says something about like, this isn't the Brill Building with, the, with their fancy big time writers. There was a shift from what was happening in the Brill Building was these very, um, uh, what's the word I want? Established. established, thank you. Very established writers. And then the thing with 1650 was with Don Kirshner and, um, and Al, what was his name? Al, uh, yeah. I'm like an Al, I'm blanking on his name, but that's where Al Dunn music came from, Don Kirshner and Al, and I'm terrible, I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, Nevins. Thank Nevins. you. Nevins, was that it? Thank you. Um, they just had this sort of wild idea, which was like, well, rock and roll is like teenage music. That's where this is coming from. That's who's buying this music. What if we got teenagers? And that was the thing. They, they went out and they found the Barry and Cynthia's and the Carol's and the Jerry's and the Neil Sadaka's and the Paul Simon's of the world. And um, yeah, Carol was 18 when Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow was number one. Or was it number one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was their first number one hit. I mean... But yeah, there's it, often confusion about that. You got 1650 and 1619, which is the Brill Building, right across the street from each other, more or less, and, you know, these different groups of writers writing at the same time. I mean, I was in Jersey Boys for a long time, and Bob Crew and Gaudio and Frankie Valli and all those guys were in 16 were in br the Brill Building. Oh, right. um, and I, I, I really think maybe it just comes down to, like, the Brill Building is easier to say it than 1650. It's like, oh yeah, that's a Brill Building the stuff. The Brill it's Building like sound. <laughs> and they're all 1650 sound. They're all influencing each other, sounds sounds each and, each other and, and all back and forth. they see each other on the I mean, it was all the same neighborhood. They'd go down to the newsstand and get the billboards at the same time. So I mean, it was all part of the same world. So if you're looking at the world from the outside, it, it's easy to sort of Lump put it all it under in. one umbrella. Yeah. Um, 1650 needs a name. And then it would feel like yeah. it would have had the same. Yeah. <laughs> a one-syllable name. Yeah, a really yeah. easy, catchy one. We'll think of it and then... Hi, Ms. Larson. Um, I've heard a lot of your stories about some of the medical things you went through when the show uh, in San Francisco, and I just admire your work ethic so Thank much. You. And I was wondering if you could talk about what was able to power you through that. Yeah, um, he's referring to the, uh, our literally day four of rehearsals. Um, we had all just met, and I started getting stomach pains. And I thought it was gas, so I didn't say anything because I'd only known them four days. Now I would talk about it with them, but four days in, um, I didn't. Turned out I needed emergency colon surgery. They had to remove eight inches of my colon. Um, and um, so they tell me that at four in the morning in the ER. And I said, well, how long is it going to take to recover? Because I'm doing this new Broadway show. And I knew how extraordinary it was going to be on some level. You don't really know, but I believed. Um, and they said it would take up to eight weeks to recover. And I didn't have eight weeks. Um, and I didn't 
really know what I was going to do. But then I woke up from the surgery and my Trinidadian night nurse said to me, tomorrow morning, you got to get up, you got to walk, you got to move because the only way they're going to let you out of here is if you poop and they're not going to feed you till you pass gas. So you got to walk, you got to get it moving on the inside. So I thought if there's something I can do to control my fate and I beat a groove in the waiting room outside my, my hospital room and six days after my surgery, I was back, staples up my belly. I was with a binder around my waist, holding it together. I was back. I'd lost 10 pounds in 10 days. And I was back in rehearsal with these guys trying to act macho like I was fine. I wasn't really fine. They could clearly tell because he always had a chair waiting for me the minute we were done with scenes. And I couldn't really sing or talk very well. But um, the producers had known me. I'd done the workshops of the show. So they knew what I was capable of. And they hung in there with me. Um, and so honestly, I, I, I thank you for... But I don't feel like there was really an option. I mean, it was, you don't give up on this. It's this extraordinary role in an extraordinary show. You, you fight for it. And then it was the group, the community, taking care of me and making it possible for me. The producers got me a car service to take me to and from rehearsals every day because there's just no way I would have been able to navigate the subway. So um, they all, everyone helped to make it possible. They, they would call me for shorter days for a while and um, you know, sort of let me take it easy. Uh, and so that's what made it possible for me to get through. It was really get by with a little help from my friends. Yeah. She was such a trooper. I mean, you wouldn't know. I mean, we kind of knew, I mean, we knew because we knew the severity of what she had gone through, but she was so strong. I mean, yeah, on the well, outside, you wouldn't, I mean, most of the cast, I feel like I had no idea quite no. how bad it was. You we could were just trying see to be sweet. Flickers in her eyes every now and again. And you'd be and, like, you know, don't be like, make me laugh because it hurts. Sit, yeah, and she, oh, God, it hurts a lot. Yeah. And I just kept thinking I was going to faint, but I couldn't let anybody know, so. Having worked with such major songwriters material, how does that, uh, are you guys songwriters? And if so, how does that influence you in terms of the songwriting you're doing or where your songwriting is going? And also, since you're looking at this history of R&B, which is, or a history of rock and R&B, did you go, I assume you went back in and watched a lot of uh, videos of TV shows and such. What were... Talk a little bit about that experience of reviewing it. Now, hopefully, you're rock historians. So, <laughs> well, there's always more to learn. But um, no, it do, it does when you play somebody when you try to get into the mind frame of somebody like that. You know, someone that has. To me, songwriting is one of the greatest talents. Like, I wish I I wish I had it because to me, I've been thinking about it a lot since we started the show. It is it is literally being able, oftentimes, to create something beautiful out of something painful, often. I mean, whether it's a love song or whatever, um, but to be able to take human experiences and like actually do something with them, not just go through them yourself, but create something beautiful out of it so that someone else can get through their version of that experience or whatever. Um, I wish I was. I've, I've dabbled in a little songwriting. I'm, I'm not sure I have the gift, um, but doing something like this, I just... I think I really do have more of an appreciation, uh, excuse me, an appreciation for it and, and what that talent is because it's, um, especially when you look at music like this that has stood the test of time the way it has, um, you just, because it's that good. It's that good. Yeah. Yeah, so many of the songs are so, I mean, I feel like it's, it's simultaneously frustrating, makes you feel terrible about yourself and also encouraging because they're so simple. I mean, musically speaking, so many of the songs in the show are variations on heart and soul. I mean, they're all one, six, four, five, one, six, four, five. You can, you can play that chord progression and sing like 15 of the songs in our show. And, the, but, and yet they make them sound so different. And then there are slight variations and it's like, that's where the genius comes in. And it's, it, again, it's, it's something you're like, well, I, if they could do it that simply, it, it, it can be done. And yet, what makes them so extraordinary is that they were able to do it and keep refining this thing down and, and distilling it until they just had this beautiful melody with a, you know with an amazing set of lyrics, whether written by Cynthia or, or Jerry or Carol. Um, uh, it, I mean, I, I wish I could do what they did, but yeah. uh, no, try as I might. I agree. I think it's the genius is in the simplicity, as I think a lot of young writers come in and they just work too hard and they gild the lily. And there's always, every night, there's a, because I play a lyricist and I'm, I'm, I'm more verbal than I am musical. They often hear stuff backstage that completely goes over my head. Um, but um, there's, a, there's a lyric every night that I feel like sort of encompasses the Jerry Goffin, who was her, who was her lyricist, Carol's lyricist, um, his genius, which is uh, from Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? I'd like to know that your love is a love I can be sure of. And it lines up perfectly so that your love and sure of rhyme. 
and you don't think about, I mean, I, we all know that song. I'd heard that song for years, and I hadn't thought, I mean, the simplest words, relaying the simplest idea, and yet that, what a genius set of words, like, th that the rhyme is perfect. I just think that it's just such a model for people who are working too hard to find rhymes for bigger things, is it's just so elegantly, deftly done, and um, that's what these two teams were just so good at. Yeah. Oh, uh, classic performances of all, of old. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you can certainly talk about this. I, I certainly went back and like watched the animals sing live because I have to sing an animals tune, and I've definitely watched old Drifters song, uh, you know, old Drifters performances, and um, and I'm I you know I'm I have a certain fascination with uh, with music history, especially like rock and pop history. So I've watched a lot of a lot of old performances of of, of those tunes. Um, but uh, I mean, did you watch a lot? of I Carol? mean, there was a point too when I uh, uh, Carol wrote a memoir like five years ago or something like that. So there was a point when I was going through that book and, and she really goes into detail about the people she was listening to and the people that, you know, she listened to these radio shows and then she'd go to the live shows. And so I was like frantically like underlining everything, be like, I gotta look this person up. And I, and I did, you know what I mean? I wish I could recall all those names now, but like we said before, these, these writers had such an appreciation of what came before them, um, which I think is just a sign of any good musician. Any good musician appreciates another good musician and will give the, give the credence to what was done before and um and and whoever is doing it well now like it's it's just a very i love musicians it's a very shared um i don't see it as a competitive sort of field i mean it is in in many ways like it has to be but it's like it's just it's a it's very collaborative it's a very collaborative art form Oh, well, I think that's a great note to end on. So please join me in thanking Jesse and Nika. Franklin's song, and I knew all of the songs that Barry and Cynthia wrote for the most part. I just didn't know that they had written them. I didn't really know who they were. But then you look at the catalog of these, you know, these couples, and it's, you know, it's extraordinary. Yeah, it's the sort of the, it's one of the really most fun parts of the show is coming to see. And I always tell people not to read the song list in the program because it's much more fun if you don't know what next what's the next song, um, because the the reveals of wait a minute they wrote that and they wrote that it, it does make you think about uh, songwriting and appreciate somebody is actually writing these hits. If if it's not a singer songwriter, um, then somebody is writing these hits. And like we wrote we wrote um, you've lost that love and feel. Um, but I sort of knew Carol's work through she worked with James Taylor a lot when they in the beginning of the 70s they were friends and they did a lot of music together and I sort of knew her stuff through him but that was that was sort of my connection with it I certainly didn't know the extent of like what we go into in the show I, even musically I didn't I didn't know as much about her as I I certainly appreciate now yeah I mean I had a similar experience and it's you know, it just goes to show, unless it's a singer-songwriter, you often don't know who writes the song. So I knew all the songs. I didn't necessarily know that Carol wrote all of them to me. You know, You've Got a Friend is like a James Taylor song, and Natural Woman is an Aretha Friend. Please join me in welcoming the stars of Beautiful, Jesse Mueller, Anika Larson, and Jared Spector. Hello. Hi. Before you started working on Beautiful, yeah. how much did you know about Carol and Barry and Cynthia and Jerry? Um, I didn't know. I certainly didn't know a whole lot about uh, Barry and Cynthia. Um, I didn't know that much about Jerry Goffin either, who was Carol King's first husband, her writing partner. Um, and they had, you know, literally hundreds of hits in like the late 50s and early 60s together. And that just really floored me to the, deg the degree to which they were extraordinary women. Um, and both of them are so humble about it and say that somehow at the time, even though they were women doing uh, uh, men's work in a, in a men's world, uh, they didn't really think about it. They didn't think of it as, as their gender as being an obstacle, that they, they just, that's what they wanted. She, Carol wanted to write music and Cynthia wanted to write lyrics. And so they did it. And, and I don't um, think they thought of it be... as groundbreaking either at no. the time. They just didn't occur to them not, not to do it. Yeah. They knew they were capable, so they just did it. Yeah. And people let them, so. Uh, yeah, um, Feeling, which is the number one song played on the radio of all time. So you know Barry and Cynthia, you just don't know you know Barry and Cynthia. And the three of you must have done a bunch of research to get to know these characters. Yeah. What was one of the things you were most surprised to learn about these people and their careers? 
I actually, one of my favorite moments of doing research was they worked at a building called 1650 Broadway, which is Broadway and 51st. And there's a picture that um, I found at one point. It's in, actually in a couple of the books about 1650. And it's um, all of the people who wrote songs there. And there were lots of hits that came out of that building. Um, but it's a picture of a sea of men in suits and two female faces. It's Carol and it's Cynthia.